in the Netherlands we call uh, Bacardi Cola. It's fighting, fighting oil. oil. <laughs> People who drink uh, Bacardi Coke, they, they're always end fighting. <laughs> Welcome to Cloud Realities, a conversation show exploring the practical and exciting alternate realities that can be unleashed through cloud-driven transformation. I'm Dave Chapman. And I'm Rob Kernahan. And it's the season three finale. We're going to take a look back over the course of the season, pick out what we think are interesting themes that have emerged naturally, and have a conversation about what's bubbled up and maybe provide some reflections on those things. But before we get to that... One of the interesting background conversations we've had over the course of the season, would you believe, between the entire production team, I include Marcel, the producer, and Ben, our sound and editing wizard in this, and of course, Rob and I, and Schalkia, is what is the best way to make a cream scone, which is an English tea, sort of cake, what would you call it, a cake? What would you call uh, it, Rob? A savoury pastry, maybe. A savoury pastry, let's call it that. Yes. Now, the ingredients of this thing are the scone itself, clotted cream, and let's say strawberry jam. Other jams are available, but I think strawberry jam is probably the preferred. Yeah, a strawberry or raspberry, something like that. Strawberry yeah. or raspberry. That's what you There are two ways you can build one of these things, and we have a divide that is centuries long is visible in the team. Half of the team think it should be built scone cream jam. And the other half of the team think scone, jam, cream. Now, Rob, what's your preferred build of an English scone? It's the only way to do it, which is the scone, the cream, and a blob of jam on top. And that is the right way. And any other way is just a disaster. So I don't know why we have this debate, but I keep trying to... You know. So basically, you're using the cream as as butter. Yeah, yeah. It's at the base. Because I like a lot of cream. So you smear it all on, nom, nom, nom. Jam adds a bit of flavour on top, happy days. But then how do you spread the jam on top of the cream? Because cream's got quite it. a loose con consistency. You blob it on, it's fine. It just drops off the spoon onto the centre of the scone. And now the other way one can do this to create a much more appropriate coverage is to go scone, <laughs> jam. use the word appropriate to try and make this sound official. <laughs> An appropriate level of coverage is, you know, put it straight onto the scone, jam straight onto the scone, get a nice even even cover, blob of cream, move that about a bit. It doesn't get like the jam and cream all mixed together so it looks unsightly. Beautiful looking thing, right? So all the way through the, like, and Rob is, as you've just heard, Rob is vociferous about his point of view. And a couple of weeks ago, Rob went out for the day, had a, had a few jars, I think, Rob, what in the it? sun. A couple yeah. of jars. It was a lovely day. It and sent to the rest until... of the team a bragging photograph of a scone built up in a certain way with like, I can't remember your exact comment underneath. It was like, but you're like, this is how you do it. You know, that kind of thing. Now, what construction was in that photo, Rob? Now, I, I, there was a moment of confusion in my life and I may have done it the alternative way, David, which is the wrong way without realizing and then proceeded to broadcast this to the entire team <laughs> <laughs> and make a huge mistake so it was literally one of the best whatsapp messages i think i've ever gotten and then proceeded to make a thoroughly entertaining afternoons chat in that whatsapp group was <laughs> one of the best ever so i thought that was a perfect culmination to an entire season long exploration of rob's confusion Ultimate confusion. Ultimate that is how confusion. bad it is. Yeah, ultimate confusion. I st I, st I don't know. Something failed in my... The captain of my brain ship must have been asleep at the helm when I did that. I don't know what was happening, but it was... this. <laughs> well, I've got it recorded and I've taken screenshots of it. C confused by a simple thing, yeah? Not even yeah, very technical. Very simple things, yeah. No, Not even technical, no. Cream I can't even get cream tea right. Or I can, but I get it wrong at times. But we've explored a lot of Rob's confusions, and I will leave it at this point to the listener to discern which ones of those were fanciful explorations made upon the spot and which ones actually might have been based on truth. <laughs> Thank you, David. I appreciate all your support in this podcast.
Okay, well, let's get on with the main subject of the show today. And joining us to unpick the season is a colleague and sometimes listener of the show, Esme van der Heesen. Esme, do you want to say hello and introduce yourself? Yeah, so hello. I'm very excited to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm a strategic partner manager at the moment for two of our core partners in technology. And I actually grew up as a CRM consultant, then moved into different roles in sales and in delivery building up to enterprise agile coaching. So uh, as you can imagine, there's quite some stuff that still needs to become a little bit more agile. Mm -hmm. So that's what I tried to bring in into our uh, relationships with our partners. Brilliant. You're you're very welcome. It's good to see you today. And we have a surprise guest coming later in the show. So we'll leave that for a reveal later. So the beginning of this season, we initially had Irvin Visser from Microsoft on. And Irvin told a, a really interesting story and we thought was a good season opener, which is about him climbing Everest and summiting Everest. And obviously that came along with some pretty great stories of adventure and moments of wonder. But what also came through in that conversation were Irvin's five lessons for change leadership, which he has both sort of built up as a result of leading change and working on change, but also like through the experiences that he found conquering a massive challenge. And his five lessons, which we think are resonant throughout the season, are focusing on getting through each day. And that's driven by the fact that there's an awful lot going on. Sometimes that can feel very pressured and very difficult. Staying calm under pressure, which I think sort of speaks for itself, but it's sometimes easier to say than it is to do. But actually, that's the way you're going to lead yourself to success. The importance of breaking big challenges down into bite-sized chunks. So obviously, in terms of his big journey, that was going from base camp to, to the camps as it went up the hill and through a project, particularly projects that can feel very long or can feel iterative. It's important to see successes as you go along, as well as being able to kind of reflect on what's gone right, what's gone wrong, and then move forward. How to assist with mental health and resilience. So we've touched on this a couple of times, which is there is a great deal going on for leaders and practitioners at the moment, and it's important to look after yourself as you go. And then finally, the importance of teamwork, playing on a team, being in position and understanding your position, and having aligned purpose. So Rob, as, as we went through the season, and maybe even the day job over the course of the last work year, what were your reflections on those? Did, one, did they, do they hold true for you still, and did they inform anything that you heard for the rest of the season? Yeah, I think they're axioms of change, and it's a great list to deal with change. And what we discussed on this season was all this wonderful new technology arriving at our door and the spectre of AI and what that's going to bring. And organisations need to know how to get it implemented and scaled. And we've discussed that a lot as we've we've gone through, but that's a good list to remember. So as you're trying to deliver change, think about those things to be able to, you know, make it happen. There's so much going on and we're at another epoch of computing starting with generative AI arriving at the front door. There's going to be a lot of change and a lot of difficulty in tackling that change. So yeah, use that list. It's a good list to create resilience. Esme, what do you think? That's, I think that's maybe the, I mean, you may have listened to the episode, but what's your, what's your reflection on those five, well, let's use Rob's word, axioms? <laughs> I think, especially, you know, thinking in, in transformation in organizational systems, it's really complex. And it's also always helpful to have it like in, in some sort of buckets. Uh, but in the end, it's about, I think, that interrelationship between all those aspects. Uh, and I really liked, his reflection, Aaron's reflection. And there's also one thing that I would like to add to the conversation, and that's being the, the person that is leading the change or being the enthusiastic person that really, you know, believes in what could happen to not really take in those emotions that, that you come across, right? There are so many people that you would like to keep the status quo as it is, um, because it's really helpful to them, or they do not know it any other way. Right. Uh, but I think one of the most important things, at least for me, is also about it's not my transformation itself. I'm not responsible for the outcome, even though it feels that way. Uh, and I think that's the most difficult part. I think you said something very important there, which is if you are a change leader or an agent of change, it is an incredibly 
energetic role which requires huge amounts of energy and I think what Erwin's list says is a way of tackling that so you don't lose momentum and energy as you're going through it all because you know as, as it says you have to climb the mountain break it down like he says Okay, so let's take those five or six pieces of advice and sort of launch forward into what we think is a, a, a pretty decent summary of some of the big themes that have come out of the, over the course of the conversations that we've had with multiple different people across the season. We've had on influencers, we've had on C-level leaders from large-scale organizations and small-scale organizations. We've had entrepreneurs, we've had hyperscalers, we have had authors and industry spectators. So we've had, we think, a, a pretty good sort of diversity of perspective across the industry over the course of the last season. Uh, and the season ran from September last year sort of through to now. So in reflecting on them, we've come out with six core themes of what we think has kind of resonated with us and bubbled up over the course of the, the season. Now, some of these are probably more uh, obvious than others. And some of them maybe are a little bit about what resonated with us as the as the production team and where we went with different episodes and things like that. So if you have different themes that have popped up for you during the course of the season, then please let us know. We'd love to hear it. But let's start with the first one. And if I remember rightly, going back to last year's uh, Summary and Reflections episode, this may well have all, also been the first one because it's sort of unavoidable at the moment. And it's our friend, artificial intelligence, very much the elephant in the room for any conversation that you have at the moment. And it's popped up both in headline episodes for us this year, as well as kind of almost a subtext in 90% of the other episodes, I suspect. I think we've looked at multiple different areas of it, from the sort of ethics of it through to the uh, implementation of it, through to proof of concepts and how different organizations are taking it in. But Rob, in terms of what stuck out for you in terms of the AI conversations that we've had, what what are the one or two things that are really sticking with you? Uh, the one that's very stark for me, I was actually reading again on this, was I, I check out what the lay view is of AI. So, you know, those who probably aren't in technology, what, what they think about it. There's two camps. There's those with huge imagination who can see the potential and, you know, 10 years in technology is a very long time. What's that going to bring? And then there's this other camp, uh, more of the Luddite perspective, which thinks it's a flash in the pan. It can't do anything. It's useless. It's not, you know, what's AI ever done for us from the classic uh, film scene? It's like the, um, the, uh, the not understanding what this actually means. Now, the generative side of AI, the creationist side is now starting to come to the forefront. And, you know, we're seeing it starting in the mech suit AI arena, but there's this distinct lack of imagination in some quarters that just think it's going to go away in six months. And it's like, I think you're missing the, the, the quite a sizable point where it's actually probably going to be the next industrialization cycle that hits humanity. Yeah, I, I, I'm surprised by people constantly who seem to think it's the, maybe not go away, but seem to think it's sort of the next generation of robots in factories, as if it's just some sort of mecha mechanization or making more efficient what we're doing at the moment. I think its impacts to me are considerably more profound than that in, in so many different ways. And, and that's before you even get to whether it will develop into like a super intelligence or, or anything like that. But even, even just as it exists today, it's potential at scale to disrupt both positively and probably negatively yeah. is so huge that even, like I said, even, even as it is today with, and we're up at, you know, chat GPT four at the moment, even at that point to me, it feels very significant. And the, the thing that sort of strikes me at the moment with it is, is the issue of scaling and whether organizations are starting to think about scaling and the implications of scaling yet. Um, because quite a lot of people seem to be wrapped around the axle of technical proof of concepts, yeah, which I'm but, not necessarily sure is the right way in, is it? But it, it's like anything when you introduce a new tool, and this is a, a, a tool currently, it takes... Did you just call me a tool? 
<laughs> I had, I, not on uh, not on recording day, but maybe after the show with Marcel over a beer occasionally. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but the uh, it takes about a decade for it to work its way through the system to become you know ubiquitous. Uh, and I think we're like what eighteen months in, maybe twelve months in. So we got a long old road yet before it becomes you know it, or its potential pro- properly reveals itself. Yeah, I saw a video today. And it was a, a guy who is very well reasoned and very rational talking about things like the development of super intelligence and what controls we should put around it and, and how you create benevolent AI and also what within AI is it may well create the problem. And it's the it's the notion of AI creating subtasks to do one major task. If your major task is that I'm gonna to fly to Spain. Your subtask is going to be, I'm going to go to the airport, I'm going to get on an aeroplane. And once you, once artificial intelligence is being asked to create subtasks, then it's creating things that are going to kind of f- further its ability to do the main task. And he was yeah. calling that out as one of, one of the most significant kind of underlying pieces. But to your point about time frames, his point was anybody who is the sort of person that you were describing at the beginning that doesn't necessarily see it as a very significant thing for the next 10 years. You would ask them to go back 10 years and say, do you think 10 years ago you could ask a computer in completely natural language any question and quote unquote, get back the opinion of a not very good expert? And like, so within 10 years, AI has got to the point where it can act as, uh, you know, kind of a stand in for a not very good expert. Now, it's not going to be long before that's a good expert and then a very good expert. And then the question they're asking themselves is, does it then supersede human intelligence? And it's fascinating. Uh, One of the most fascinating things I think that's, that's troubled us right this far. Esme, from the outside, have you, where are you on this? And, and, you know, what have you been thinking? It actually makes you think about this phrase, which is called, if, if you change the way you look at something, the way you look at actually changes. So I think it really is about perspective. If you look at, you know, what AI or Gen AI is 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 going to bring us from an industrial mindset, from a perspective that we know what's going to happen if we change part B for part C and we can absolutely predict what's coming next, then AI is more of a machinery upload or upgrade. But if you look at it from like the rainforest, like the volatile world that we actually live in, it has huge potential that we cannot even rasp our head around so i think it's that and and it's the same with renovating a house right if you have a partner that is absolutely not able to imagine how the color might look like or if we remove this type of wall or then it's completely different and we have somebody that completely is open to uh, visioning how something can look like so i think that's the same with ai and maybe also if you have more of a dystopian mindset or a utopian mindset i'm more of the latter Mm -hmm. Uh, So Mm -hmm. I really am enthusiastic about what it can bring me as a human being. Uh, Maybe, you know, work is going to be completely different than we can even imagine right now. Do we even work? You know, if we have technology doing all kinds of stuff for us, what what does it mean? Maybe we can just be on holiday all the time. Or is there even a holiday then? You know? Well, what what's a holiday when you're not working? Yeah. Yeah, Maybe, Maybe you'll take a couple of weeks, a couple of weeks a year and do some work. The um, it's that that's very much uh, that I, I like your vision of the, the. It's almost like the Star Trek view of the future, where technology has only aided humanity in becoming much more successful and altruistic. Unfortunately, I'm a bit more Terminator too, where humanity will screw it up yet again and make a right mess of it. So uh, it's a good yin and yang to the old co- and, conversation. And remember, Rob is speaking deep from the heart of the Matrix here, because he's, he's convinced <laughs> uh, himself over the course of season three that we are indeed living in a simulation. <laughs> Yeah, that Anders Inset episode. Still, I was thinking about that yet again the other day, and it's just like, yes, I think I'm edging slowly closer to we are, but there we go. That's for another episode. So for the record, Esme, do you think we're living in a simulation? Or do you think this is all real? No, no. And I think real is has so many, many layers. Mm. Uh, so, you know, and all realness can be true. Well, I welcome your optimism. <laughs> we need a bit of that on the show, don't we? It's just me in the corner going, hey, we're going to mess it up again, aren't we? Yeah. Yeah, I also just wanted to call out, of course, we had the the great Gene Kim 
on the show this year. It's always a treat to have Gene come in and give a view on things. He's an oracle at this stuff. But he's in his new book, Wiring Your Organization for Success, I thought he talked about three very interesting concepts when it comes to trying to embed new ways of working and, and digital practices into your organization. And he referred to them as slowification, simplification, and amplification. Esme, how did that resonate with you? And what was your takeaway of that, of that framework? And maybe just give us a little view on, on what that, how that framework works. Yeah, I, th- I think that's amazing. I absolutely love his work. Uh, also, how he talks about the DevOps Handbook uh, and the Phoenix Project. I think we all know that. If we, you talk about tech or, or DevOps or agile coaching or whatever, I think we all know the work of uh, of him. It's Cortex, the Cortex, aren't they? Yeah, it is. It is. It's the same with the Agile Manifesto, right? I think that's the, the next best thing that you should read or that people talk about uh, are those books. And, you know, being in the midst of quite some transformations myself, I think we can all relate to, to slowification is, you know, to the, the speed in the way we work together is highly, we, everything needs to be done yesterday. Mm. I think being able to slow down and really see what's going on and try to make it as simple as possible. I think that resonates uh, a lot for at least a lot of people that would like to work that way or that something that they would love to have. So we should make room for that. And it, it also resonates with, you know, being uh, highly connected, but loosely coupled uh, to have uh, autonomous teams that are able to do the work end to end to really connect all the parts that should be able to do the work on their own autonomously. But at the same time, you really want teams to be able to learn from each other. And I think that's some of the things that we see in a lot of organizations that's still missing, that you have some high performance teams as we all uh, want to have, right? We all need high performance teams. But you do if you have one single high performance team, but the other teams are, are lacking or falling behind, you, you should really look into that high performing team to help the others. So I think that in the end is really the essence of also what uh, what is in all the books that have been presented by Kim as well. Yeah, and I think Rob, we constantly return to diversity on the show and the importance of diverse workforces in, in all different dimensions and whatever that means to you, it's relevant. And we think it's fundamentally important for how organizations should function, whether they're digital or not, but sort of especially when they're digital as you're going through that transformation, having diverse teams executing on the transformation and then running things afterwards, we think builds better products and we think allows for successful outcomes that appeal more to society. But what in diversity for you is critical when it comes to digital transformation? I mean, there's lots of science that shows that diverse teams create better outcomes, and that's been around for a while. So we know the science says we should. I think when you're thinking about all the change, we started with Irwin's point, change is a difficult thing. Diverse teams can often tackle that much more easily as well. Uh, The issue we have in technology and becoming digital is the difficulty in the throughput of, say, something like gender diversity. We discussed the women in data point, which I think was our most downloaded episode in the end. It was indeed. Um, I think the how it's almost like a societal construct that's causing barriers right from when school starts and how those norms are set, which is preventing an easy balance to be struck with um, technology organizations. And I think it's a, a, a continuing fight that we must have to balance, but it's not actually materially moving in the right direction at the moment. And the concern is, what are we going to do to change that? Because it's important that we do. Esme, do you have a perspective? I find it sometimes difficult to talk about this gender diversity because I'm a woman and sometimes you feel like, oh, I've been put into this room (laughs) to to uplift the numbers. Uh, So I think it's difficult from both sides. As soon as you talk about diversity, we're talking about you're different than me. So I'd rather talk about inclusiveness. You know, um, someone said in the, in the Netherlands, it's not about being invited to the party. It's about being allowed to start dancing with everyone else. Mm. Um, so I'd rather, you know, emphasize that. Nonetheless, it is definitely necessary to, on all uh, sides of an organization, you really need to deep dive in your biases and make sure that everyone feels welcome, uh, no matter what gender you are. Let's move on to another thread that we've talked about on this season. And we've looked at digital transformation in the micro and the macro. And what we mean by that is what, when you scale out to a large scale organization, 
does digital transformation look like? And we were lucky enough to have Unilever and Fresenius in particular, as well as a number of other smaller case studies and spe- more specific case studies and other organizations talking about their macro changes. And then we also zoomed in in a couple of occasions and most recently looking at a biotech case study where a specific end-to-end process had been underpinned by a data platform and transformed in terms of how fast it was running, but also in terms of the kind of outcomes it was giving. And we wanted to do that because we wanted to try and draw a parallel between what good digital transformation really looks like in the small scale and in the very large scale. And why that's different from me digitalizing something. So, Rob, when you when you look at the summary takeaways from that exploration, what what's with you? For me, the big one is when you actually take the core of what you do and you change it. And what I mean by that is like an organization that goes to market in one direction and might choose to move into a different industry or completely change the way they interact with the end user, etc., that and then you using technology and the power of technology to deliver that that is being digital and leading digital where technology and business are one and the same thing they are integrated and they are conjoined the 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 sad side of it is or as you call it the digitalization is where i take what i do today and i get a computer to do it faster well uh, great brilliant well done round of applause but it's not what it's about and those organizations that have dug deep and reinvented themselves at the core and used technology to make it reality are the ones that are most excited and they succeed and they grow faster yeah the the book i think it was 2014 being digital basically said digital organizations grow 30% faster because they reinvent themselves and they use technology to do it. So and for me, those stories just exemplify that think different and change the core. Esme, have you drawn a distinction before between digitalization and digitization? And what do those two things mean to you? I think I can relate to what Rob is actually saying. That's the first for somebody. Uh, sorry, can we just stop recording our down? <laughs> somebody understood 100 episodes and somebody understood 100 episodes to get to this. <laughs> Mark it down, it, Rob, Marcel. It. Mark it down. Uh, so, no, I think it really is about changing something or transforming something. And for me, the digital part is about transforming something. But it doesn't mean that everything needs to be digital anyway. Although, also, because if, if it's better in human-to-human contact, then it shouldn't be digitized at all. Right, so it is about the core what you're trying to do, and how can te- technology either help, or maybe it cannot. I think we should also have that question on the table mm. more than 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 we usually do in a technology centered world. You know, it's about the human connection, right? We do not need the digital part at all. So this was a really interesting Rory Sutherland, who's a marketing exec, talks about sort of this angle, and he he has a great use case, which is the doorman at hotels, and the very purest consultant comes in and basically says, we can remove the doorman, save you this money, and we'll replace it with a computer or a process or something. And that's what they do. But what they're not encapsulating is what exactly you said, is what the doorman does is set the expectation and the reputation of that establishment as you come in, gives you a friendly welcome, makes you feel good about this hotel. And actually by removing them, you've removed some human warmth and actually it changes people's perceptions of the establishment and therefore they might go elsewhere. So you might save a salary or two, but actually the wider business impact is so much greater. And what I like about him, he, he really thinks about that human interaction side and how the humans actually respond to that t- type of stuff. And sometimes I think in the purest transactional world that we can occasionally slip into, we forget that. Also from the employee side, right? Because we, I worked at a bank and we were completely transforming their end-to-end customer journeys. And there were like 40 people handing in, copying documents and then, you know, putting it in another drawer. And we were like, what? what, what? This is the easiest way to really make cost efficiency. And then the CEO actually said, no, no, no. We're, they are here now for 20 year plus. They are going to continue doing that because that's the way they actually feel connected to our company. And we're not all focused on cost efficiency. So I really love that, not only from a customer point of view, the human connection, but also from an employee point of view. Yeah, that's a good point. Internally as well, we don't want complete and total automation because we do actually have to connect with you. Sorry, during COVID, I went broadly stir crazy, not being around big crowds. And it's that thing and that energy you get from being around other people. So uh, yeah, it's a good point not to forget the human touch.
It wouldn't have been, I think, representative of what's going on in the world today if we didn't look at the economic headwinds that a lot of the world is is facing and how transformation gets done in those difficult times. And that sometimes means difficult priority calls. That sometimes means the use of technology and different methodologies. And this year we did quite a few deep dives into the world of FinOps and trying to understand this dilemma between do you go to the cloud and if I go to the cloud, does my business case work? And when I get there, is it like, is it going to be really expensive? And, you know, how does the cloud help me with my financial challenges? So I guess before we get on to that, like Esme, in terms of just your experience of the economy this year, what's your observations? And have you seen any different kind of behaviors from clients and the people that you're working with as a result of economic, you know, challenges? Yeah, definitely. Especially in retail, uh, at least in the Netherlands. Uh, you see them, you know, being cautious uh, and really focusing on on cost reduction, and uh, so yes, definitely. And and obviously, also in the public sector, we're all in the political environment we're in right now. So not only economical but also political. Very right. Yep. It absolutely touches each and every one of our customers. Um, so yeah, the influence is big, and I think we we maybe that's also not knowing to plan ahead for three to five years. It doesn't absolutely doesn't make any sense because we never know where go- what's going to happen next. Yeah. So yeah, there's a huge uh, dynamical change going on and uh, we can only know what we do not right now, I think. Yeah, I think there's something, behaviors that I've definitely seen very understandable in the circumstances of, of decision-making sort of being, being pushed back, I think, until people get a greater sense of certainty, particularly around investments. And then you come to, you know, different types of conversations around transformation and, and post-cloud migration, like I said, in, in, in the world of FinOps. So Rob, summarize up the world of FinOps as, as it pertains to how you might use it in this situation. There's an analogy I often think about with FinOps and the weirdness is when people forget to do it. If you had your personal bank account and every day some, something was taken out 50 pounds a day and you didn't use the service that was taken out, you'd very quickly move to stop that coming out of your bank account. And what is bizarre to me is organizations that don't do FinOps are having money taken away from them that they could be using for important things. And it's like, I, I, don't, I still don't get the why they don't act on it because a pound saved today is a pound profit or a pound to pay for transformation tomorrow. And so what is FinOps? It's an ingrained thing that sits at the core of your operating model that goes as far left as you can. And it starts with when the architects and the developers devise something that they do that in the most efficient way possible. You've still got to have the efficacy there, but the efficiency has to be baked in. And then this constant looped learning where you're looking at what's going on and you're optimizing. And I think back, I think it was season two, we had the conversation about the flywheel effect book where the um, Liberty Mutual had completely changed their core to serverless architecture and taken 70% out of their bill. And they're thinking right at the core about how they create deep efficiency and actually improve efficacy on the way. And and, and that is what, to me, FinOps is. However, I still am alarmed by the amount of organizations that don't engage with it properly, but you're you're, you're, not literally throwing money away, but it's basically the same thing. But I think it's the fact that a lot of organizations, and to a certain extent, this aspect of it's understandable, I think, don't recognize a couple of things when they go into a a large scale transformation of this nature. The first is like how profound that transformation is. So it's not just moving your stuff into a different style of data center. It's going to reset your financial frameworks. It's going to reset your cadences. It's going to reset everything, but yeah, changes literally everything that's going on. So that's the first aspect I think that gets underestimated. Even, even now, like people take for granted the cloud and this, Oh, we've been a, it's been 10 years now. But actually, if you haven't done it, it's still a very difficult thing to grapple with at scale. The second aspect of it is the, the fact that FinOps itself is a whole discipline that yep. didn't exist before. It's a, it's a different interface between you know, f- the finance team and IT, and that often can be a transactional fractious relationship, and that needs to turn into something like really profoundly different. And even the FinOps community themselves who we found out, interestingly, have a festival every year. The FinOps Festival. Something a great that, idea, that is. 
I, I, I'd like to go to one. And I think our idea of um, taking a game share so you could make that festival a proper party, is, I think it's fair. But the development of that discipline, they're, they're still working out for themselves, aren't they, Esme? They're, they're, yeah, not, you know, they're not even clear themselves. But I think it's also about who usually gets, you know, the most conversations when there's a large bill regarding IT. It's the CIO, right? He needs to uh, make amends and, and try to explain why uh, costs are getting higher and higher. And it really is something that should be discussed in the uh, on sea level board as well. So each and every one should feel responsible about all the costs that we're putting into IT. Not only the CIO, who is usually the one that gets the, the tough conversations. There's an analyst at Gartner. He's very, very good. Adam Ronthal. And he talks about very advanced concepts in what AI and FinOps will become. And he basically says there's two types of product owners, those who have been hauled over the coals by their CFO and those who are about to be hauled over the coals of the CFO because they've wasted money. And it's this point about the, it's an inevitability that it's going to arrive. But that relationship between finance and rebooting that as part of your operating model change is, this is this exemplifies the, the need to do it. Absolutely critical. And the other thing we've examined in this space, like moving away from the financial aspect of technology and moving on to the power and energy implications of technology is is green ops and how green ops can be used to help with understanding how to make your processing consumption more sustainable. So, Rob, is green ops the same as fin ops? Uh, no, but they're linked. So certain... They're aligned. Let's be honest. I know there's a confusion that says if I'm financially efficient in my cloud, then I'm doing green ops. That's not true because green ops is is a wider view about, well, when you buy your service or consume your service, where did it come from? What type of power did it use, et cetera? So you can buy services in the cloud that may not be sourced from green energy. And so green ops takes that wider about electing. You might actually elect to pay more for a service but it has better CO2 credentials associated with it. So green ops is about things like reducing impact on the planet, as you might expect, but that doesn't always equate to financial benefit. Now, generally, if you reduce your financial uh, charge, you will probably be reducing your consumption, but it doesn't mean that that consumption is from a great source. So that, And that's the line that you really need to think about is they can be compatible, but sometimes they're not. And in fact, you might pay more to reduce CO2 because it's uh, a, a, a better way to source your service. The, the other thing that resonated with me in one of those conversations, uh, beyond beyond the tooling of it, which has quite a bit of commonality, is how motivational it can be for the humans in the system to respond more to green ops style yeah. targets and reductions than, than it might be for them to be responding to sort of financial ones, frankly. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I mean, if you think about motivating your staff, the worst thing you can do is turn up and say, we're going to increase shareholder value. What we need to talk about is proper purpose, which is we're doing this to create a product that people love, or we're doing this to help uh, improve our environment, or we're do- doing this to make lives generally better. And that's what people respond to. So shareholder value, well, obviously in our capitalist society, it's important, but nobody really cares when you're on the ground trying to do stuff day to day. Yeah. Yeah. It rings hollow. I mean, sometimes people go after those targets because you know, you need to, and you need to create financial health, but it, it can ring hollow. But I think Esme, the, 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 the pursuit of more sustainable consumption of, of processing power is much more motivational, isn't it? It is. And to be honest, we should really, I think, challenge our partners on it as well, because as you can imagine, we have technology partners that are being um, motivated to get their KPIs and increase the usage of cloud consumption, which I can understand. But on the other hand, we also want to go for green. And I don't know if all our partners in our ecosystem are being challenged on, on, you know, that it's a combination of those two KPIs or that it's solely the usage of cloud. Uh, so that's something that I really want to bring into all the conversations that we have with our partners as well. And some vendors aren't under the spotlight yet. If you remember the conversation we had, especially those who create code or have very large platforms that are deployed, haven't quite got there yet with the green credentials and they've kind of escaped 
um, the discussion, but it's coming and it's coming soon because ever more conversation is about how efficient is the compute of your platform. So thinking about better algorithm efficiency, thinking about better utilization of uh, storage and resources like that makes a big difference. And the wave's coming because AI is driving huge consumption, which is driving cost. And the next wave will be about algorithm efficiency. So I think software will come into sharp focus fast in this area. And it's a topic close to our heart eh, for our listeners. If you look at, for example, and listen to the episode, Should Cloud Cost the Earth from Mark Butcher? Just listen to that episode. And it was really an eye-opener for not only me, but also for a lot of listeners. And it's in the top six of uh, podcasts uh, last season. So Yeah, you can, you can definitely see that the subjects that were popular over the course of the uh, last year when you look at the download numbers and yeah this is our sustainability episodes are, are definitely the the ones that rank highly across the top 15 or 20 episodes in the season yeah just going back to your point though for a sec rob i think the other aspect to the sort of the increasing power hungriness of some of the systems that are being developed the other thing that sits in there as well as making those as efficient as possible from a code perspective is the underlying processor sets, right? Like the, at reInvent a couple of years ago, there was a lot of uh, announcements around twice the processing power for half the consumption. That's got to continue as a trend, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, semiconductor. I mean, there's a massive issue with this area. So they're talking racks taking 100 kilowatts to work for AI, right? And they're being built and that's too much. So we must get efficiency into the underlying platform, and that comes from the processor. And I mean, you've seen the share price of NVIDIA uh, and such like. Um, huge investment is going into that. But it's also incumbent on those to take that and use it and flip their systems onto these new processors. And it can be done quite easily at times. And I think this is what cloud allows you to do dead easily. And I, again, going back to the FinOps point, reducing consumption via a change in processor set will also save you money and it's an easy thing to do. And actually, often when you flip your processor set and you do it properly, you get more performance out of it as well. You're two for half type point and uh, still in action in many organizations to embrace that. And it's as simple as shutting down your server, rewriting the config file and starting it back up. Obviously, you do your testing and all that associated with it, but it is a, a, a codifiable change. And I still am surprised that people are leaving that on the shelf as potential untapped. Yeah, it's it's odd that config changes and dev changes and code changes, some of which are harder than others, some of which are easier than others, do at the moment seem to be edge conditions for some organizations and not and they're not they're not a mainstay of the of the conversation. Yeah. And if it's the old crap data center where you you've written off the investment over three, five years, whatever, and you've got old servers, then okay, fair enough. You're you're stuck in that mechanism but if you're on cloud and you're not doing this what you're just like ah don't understand it is deeply frustrating at times we just go do you know how simple it actually is to make that change yeah so as me i don't know whether you've noticed of also over the course of this uh, season but rob has become increasingly obsessed is that is that the right word you can go with obsessed yeah go on go for that with one. with the notion of how Technology and society are resetting a little bit, and a, a series of observations over the course of this season. Some of which in the confusion bit at the beginning of the of each episode, uh, but some also born out in the in the wider conversation. So, Rob, in your mind, what have you been getting at? Uh, so, technology, right? It's come along. It's changed our lives. I'll use social media because it's the worst one, right? Social media has been responsible for ripping our society apart. It's caused binary conversation, the whole tweet, and get your entire argument into a hundred-ish characters uh, for nuanced concepts. And then just the ability to be almost semi-anonymous and shout at everyone, right? It's this thing that is people are now waking up to, to say social media is bad for us unless used responsibly. And we all need to remember our manners when we go online. And I'm seeing a rise in people disconnecting from social media. I'm seeing a rise in people becoming wary of social media. They're starting to understand that it's peddling fake news. And then you add on deep fakes and things like this that it isn't perceived as it once was. And I, I am thinking 
there is a reset coming via society and things like bad terms and conditions and uh, data breaches and all this sort of stuff is also making people wake up to what technology providers are doing. The monetization of you for a free service, I think, is coming into sharp contrast. And through that, I'm hoping over the next few years, people become more responsible with technology. However, again, I go back to the human capacity to mess it all up every time. So maybe it won't happen and people will be too obsessed with their TikToks. Sorry, I'll go my soapbox now. I think uh, to, to look at this from a utopian point of view again, right? Uh, so I absolutely understand Thank what you're God. saying. There are like Balance. waves, waves <laughs> of God. personalization, especially also in the marketing space, hyper-personalization, right? I also heard you being a bit confused about your, your smartwatch. I actually have oh, the yeah. same, you know, do I want to use it still? It, why do I all need all those notifications, turning them off? What You know, it's like a, a dumb watch right now. Yeah. So I absolutely understand that. And it actually makes me enthusiastic because what I see, and that's also what you see in research, is that what, what they aim to see is the new wave is about authenticity. Again, the human connection. So I think this is part of us trying to make sense of what do we want technology to do and what do we want for ourselves to really connect in the end. So I think this is just part of a larger, I don't know, wave that we're in the midst of. Uh, and it, it really makes me hopeful because I hope we end up, you know, not sitting on a yoga mat and, and, and kumbaya, my Lord, every day, but, uh, but really about connecting and, and making the difference as humans. So, um, yes, I understand your confusion and also social media, and, but I think this is just part of us trying to make sense of uh, real communication and connection. So I think the thing for me maybe, and I think I'm broadly in, in your space, Esme, though I do have days when I think about it, the darker side of it. But I think broadly, I'm in your place. And the the thing that's a little missing for me, I think, in in society's use of this stuff, and it's even more important when you think about AI, is governance and control. Now, I used to be a person, I don't know whether this comes just along with getting a little bit older and a little bit more jaded, but I used to be a person who used to think, well, you know, like, complete freedom of all of this stuff would be a brilliant thing, wouldn't it? And actually, I think we've seen some issues with a complete freedom approach, which I think is going to be specifically challenging when it comes to AI. And we had a couple of really meaningful episodes, I think, where we had Father Paolo Benanti on at the Christmas episode, and he was talking about the Rome call for AI ethics, which is a big bit of work that's being done out of the Vatican with the United Nations to try and create an ethical framework for usage around AI. And we've also had recently a member of the European Parliament on who was talking about governance and governance of these sorts of technologies. So it seems to me that is the right way through this a governed deployment of these things? Yeah, there's this thing about society, right? We run to rules and we all live by that rule set because it's a common understanding of how we all get along. Right, And that's worked for hundreds of years, thousands of years, and you elect your government and they set those rules or they change those rules. With the internet and social media, it does feel a little bit like those rules were removed and people forgot, you know, you sort mm -hmm. of read what people would write on social media and said, if you were actually stood in front of that human being and the social contract was in play, you wouldn't have said that. And it's that which is, we need to think differently about how those rules are applied because, you know, code of laws has been around for a long time for a very good reason and there are some very important ones that we you know we find we must obey and so it's it's getting those embedded but it's also importantly remembering that technology transgresses or goes across nation state boundaries where rule sets have to be agreed globally and i still think that globally we're struggling to work out how to do that but it's lovely that the you know like the un and the vatican are embracing what ethics and can morally say to people this is probably a good way to think about it but it's it's something that we've not tackled before and technology and social media has given us a new problem to deal with and um, we haven't quite covered ourselves in glory with sorting it out yet yeah i think the other aspect of that when it comes to social media is the fact that social media has largely replaced print media for news yeah. and where print media, which may have had certain biases and certain leanings in certain political directions, at least that was bound by in, in almost all countries, some, some sort of framework and, and was held accountable in certain ways. And I think the sort of an unintended consequence of social media is the impact that it's had on that. 
And then, of course, it's launched forward with being quite ungoverned from what people are saying on that platform. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, on a newspaper, there's an editor, and an editor is responsible for making sound decisions. And in the new world, the editor's role has been removed, and they say it's the platform's problem. And then the platform says, well, you know, you can't do that, because how can we control all of this craziness above us? And the individual devolves responsibility away, you know, say it's on the internet, so I don't care. And we haven't quite worked out what the structure is. I'm sure we will, and it will balance, and Esme, to your point, You've got to believe in the good in the human at times. So um, hopefully we'll find we'll find the right answer. But I, I feel there's a reset going on and it'll change. It makes me think actually about how many times do we have seen acceptance criteria in the release of a product that actually relates to norms and values? Yeah. As, and that is a good point about the, uh, you know, these very large online platforms which are coming under regulation uh, in a good way as you know, things like the EU start to tackle them, I think that the norms and the values are creeping in to say there is certain behaviour intrinsic to how our society wants to operate and you have a responsibility. And to date, they've got away with not having to manage that. So maybe just to bring our conversation to a bit of a close today, I think it wouldn't be a review of the year without talking about, and God help me as I say this, Go on, Dave, do it. Convergence and <laughs> the role that convergence is playing at the moment with multiple different types of technology coming together. Now, this isn't a new thing, of course. It's, it, joking aside, has been going on for quite some time now. But, Rob, it's something I know that you bring up quite often, especially after you learn how to use the Uber app when we were in um, <laughs> when we were at Google Next and you finally got your head around it, like a light bulb moment. You saw the light on converging technology. So walk us through it, Rob. I maybe had the view a bit before the Uber app, but yeah. it, it's, uh, it's your the best. Use, your usage of it wouldn't suggest that. It is bringing together the virtual and the physical uh, to provide new ways of services to humans through that convergence. So as an example, the Uber app is a great one. You have a phone that exists, that used to go ring, ring. And then somebody said, let's give it an internet connection. And then somebody went, well, let's put a GPS sensor in it. Somebody put satellites in space so the GPS chip can can work. And then somebody brought together the idea of an app and then they integrated that with a person owning a car and then the driver can register the other end. So we connect two humans together who one wants a service, the other one wants to provide it. And all that technology works to allow you to say, I'm here and I want to go there. And it's a, a, a really low friction way of transport. And you can see it everywhere. I mean, AR and VR is a great example as well, where we're merging the physical with the virtual. We've talked about the clunkiness of that, but it's being refined. I thought Roberto from Zakeke's point on, we want to try and get digital experiences as close to the physical, but actually yeah. there's also the f physical experiences need the functionality and experience of the digital, I thought was a, was a, was a really interesting way to frame that. Yeah, and it's, it's bringing it closer together. So we blur the boundaries. I mean, we had that one with Ganymede where they'd connected the IT and the OT together to improve the scientific process. It's another good example of convergence occurring and it's getting more and more, but what it does is it widens the potential for what technology can do for the human. And I'll go back to the, it's accelerating and it's getting faster and miniaturization of technology is also helping, meaning that if you take your smartwatch now, it can measure your blood, do your hearts, it can tell you you're healthy, it can start to inform you more about the physical use so the digital informing the human about how they can improve their life. I mean, it's just, you know, another use case. And talking about kind of examples of convergence around the auto industry and the car industry, of course, we had the bit of a privilege of of being one of the launch media for the Afila in Sony's big launch at CES earlier this year. How did that strike you, Rob, as a new experience being created as a result of convergence in a really different sort of way? Yeah, it's uh, completely changing the experience in the car, integrating a 3D gaming engine into it, sort of changing the way the human operates with the technology, making what could be a, a mundane journey more exciting. So yeah, just improving the human's experience again and making long car journeys more fun. Esme, have you had any particularly notable examples over the course of the last year or so where 
you've had an experience that has brought together multiple strands of technology and you've and it's just given you a moment of pause. One of my team members actually suffers diabetes and he has the highest rank, so he needs to be careful with it all the time. And he actually now, you can see that technology is really helping him throughout the day. And I think that it has so much impact on him. And we all know we hear his phone beep all the time, but we're so used to it. So in the beginning, it was like, gosh, where does that, you know, annoying beep comes from? And now we actually understand and know what it's, you know, what it's saying. And we can actually help him out as soon as we know, oh, he needs some Diet Coke. Who's going to get it? Uh, and that, for me, makes it really personal. And also it binds us as a team to understand how the technology is really helping him uh, be healthy. So we can actually say up front, OK, we're going to go get some dinner or beer afterwards. We know we need to. To tell him up front so that he can actually, you know, make sure that he's okay and he can he can make it there as well. So that's just one of the things on the hindsight, or at least I know from a technology point of view, it's not that easy to get that technology and that data connected. He's a real techie, he's a software engineer uh, in background, so he knows how to do it, but it's not that easy to do it at the moment. And I think that those are things that I hope we can all learn from and that society and all organizations are, are willing and open to integrate that in the ecosystem to really help our, our, our humans, uh, you know, be better in health. That, that's a cracking example because that, that the advantage of being able to continually monitor your blood sugar, have Indeed. that reported. Without having day. to get blood all the time, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then you're planning your day. So it's reducing the burden on the individual to be able to, to manage the situation. It's, 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 a, it's actually better than the two I came up with. <laughs> there you go. Not competing. <laughs> Quite a good note to finish the show on in the sense of, one, a better example than Rob came up with, <laughs> and two, a very human example. So a lot of the things that we've talked about, about all of the aspects of today's show, like all of that back-end processing that's got challenges, all of the new layers of intelligence that have been built into things that have got challenges, the things that's challenging to build into your organizations. But actually, at the end of the day, these things can come together to create quite amazing solutions that help humans. So welcome back now to our special guest. And I'm glad to say that our special guest is Shauki Zal. Shauki, how are you? Very good. Thank you for having me. <laughs> it's good to see you. Yeah. What have you been up to? Yeah, a lot. An awful lot. A very busy day job focusing on Gen AI at the moment. Well, sad to say, and you may have guessed it, given that Shauki has not been on a few of the last episodes towards the end of the season, but Shauki is leaving the show. And I think, Shauki, that's so you can focus quite hard on a, a, an ever-expanding day job, isn't it? Yeah, 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 it is. Yeah, yeah. It's quite, it's getting more and more difficult to combine the both mm. publishing or producing a weekly show and also focus on Gen AI in my day job, which is extremely busy. So uh, it's getting more and more difficult. And I think it would be a missed opportunity not to take a moment of reflection and look back on the journey that we've been on. So we started this show, I think, nearly two years ago. I think we've done something like 30 live episodes and 70 studio episodes with a whole host of different people. What are your reflections on that as a journey? Because you hadn't done a pod before this one, right? No, no, this was the first time. I did a lot of live events and presentations and video recordings, but a podcast is really different. Hmm. You have a much more uh, in-depth conversation and the way that we set it up, it's all around the guests, right? So you learn an awful lot from them. And that's also uh, what I actually did, right? We had extremely interesting guests, Mm. good conversations, and we got a great overview of what is happening in the industry at the moment around cloud, around other innovative technologies, but also and maybe on the people side of it and how important that part is in each and every technology, Mm. project, solution, or company. And I really learned a lot from that. It gave me also a lot of uh, new, valuable insights in how I am positioning my day job, right? Right, right. And the conversations that I have with clients, and uh, yeah, very valuable. Brilliant to hear. Yeah, I feel the same, actually. You know, just the experience of having one really, really good conversation a week makes actually makes such a big difference to how much information you're absorbing and how much expertise you can, you know, kind of take on and, and, and pick up almost by osmosis from these things. 
Yeah. Um, it's a it's a real privilege uh, to talk to guests like this. Do you have any favorite episodes or any episodes that stand out for you? I like the diversity and inclusion uh, episodes that we had. Mm. And of course, the general islands. Right. Of which there were many. There were many, yeah. I, I think unexpectedly in setting this show up, when we first set it up, Gen AI hadn't released. And I think it came out, I think OpenAI released ChatGPT, I'm going to say two. It might be, I can't remember what, which one it was. But it was, it was the one that then caused sub, you know, subsequently large furore. And almost from the outset, AI started to dominate the conversation, I thought. Yeah, to be honest, it was quite difficult to find a different trend yeah. than one about AI. Yeah. yeah, it did come up often. It did yeah. come up often. <laughs> yeah. And have you come to a personal conclusion about whether we're living in a simulation or not? I think we are. Do you? And I, and I hope we are, yeah. yes. <laughs> you hope we are? <laughs> yes, I hope we are, yeah. <laughs> God, I, I'd like to think that if they did it, it would be better than this. <laughs> <laughs> maybe you're right yeah, maybe yeah. you're right <laughs> so what got you to the conclusion that we are how did you get there because rob is slipping into the abyss with this this whole thing like every every day he gets darker on the subject really yeah uh, oh i think it's the the most positive way to uh, to approach it right yeah yeah it's a bit more fun if it is a simulation that we are that's living true. in well you, you know what you should do if you if you are convinced of that you should try and break through the programming like neo and uh maybe become like a superhero oh wow yeah i, I think, think that, about that I, I think yeah. the opportunity is sitting right there for you now especially now you're not yeah. doing this all, all of that spare time just imagine you're totally you're totally right i, I will give that some thought yeah, yeah. you should you should <laughs> Well, look, thank you for popping back in to say hello. It wouldn't have been an end of season show without you. And obviously, I'm sure I speak on behalf of the listeners and certainly on behalf of the presenters and the production team. We're going to miss you on the show hugely. Yeah, I will miss you all very much as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, certainly we hope you keep in touch and maybe drop in from time to time to say hello and keep us track of what you've been up to. Or if you come up with, you know, obviously if you find any research or anything you've been looking at, and you want to come back and drop it on us, then there's always a place. Okay, I will keep that in mind, and I will definitely do that, yeah. Now, of course, we end every episode of this podcast by asking our guests and ex-presenters what they're excited about doing next, and that, of course, could be you've got an excellent restaurant booked at the weekend, or it could be something exciting in your professional life, or it could be both. Schauke, what are you excited about doing next? I'm very excited about the summer period coming up. I bought a Kamado barbecue with all sorts of uh, add-ons on top of it. What's the specifics of that type of barbecue? Yeah, it's like a, a green egg, right? You oh, have a, right. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm looking forward to uh, prepare huge pieces of meat <laughs> on there. <laughs> I noticed the way you paused before you said that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and hopefully with some good weather as well, because uh, up to up until now, it we didn't not, really have any summer. not been great, has it? Although I, I did notice today when I was getting ready for this and just doing sort of general work, I was wearing a jumper as normal. I was actually too warm. And I think that's the first time that's happened this year. I noticed yeah. you're also wearing a t-shirt. Yeah, that's you know? also uh, yeah, yeah. a unique thing this year. <laughs> so, so you never know. The summer could yeah. well be here. So I will be barbecuing all summer. Well, enjoy it enjoy it and we wish you luck in what you're doing next and hope to see you soon thank you esme what are you excited about doing over the summer oh we're gonna travel to iceland and it's been on the top three of our lists uh, from a long time ago so um yeah really looking forward to dive into the culture and look at those beautiful serene environments while we go through the entire country yes absolutely yes. spectacular place now the big question is are you going to be eating rotten whale meat who knows, you know? Because <laughs> that is a delicacy, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Uh, if the chef is able to, you know, maybe is, in hindsight, he's going to say, do you know what you've eaten? I'm open to everything. So It's daunting to me that, I have to say. Like, I'm a relatively adventurous eater, but that one does sound like a challenge. Have you ever eaten kangaroo? Uh, I've eaten kangaroo. I've had springbok and things like that, but I'm not sure I've had kangaroo. It tastes like chicken. I don't think rotten will meat tastes like chicken. Just oh, going to put that I'm out there. Tell you just, yeah, yeah. Point. The, the human has evolved over thousands of years to avoid such things as we would smell it and go, oh, my senses tell me to avoid this because it might make me ill. And then suddenly, somehow, we managed to make this a delicacy. What? 
I don't know, mate, take it up with uh, the Icelandics. But what a beautiful country generally, amazing stuff. And have you got things like the uh, Blue Lagoon booked and stuff like that? Yes, yes, certainly. We're going to go all in. Just go to all the highlights that people talk about and have amazing pictures afterwards. Well, have a wonderful time. Thank you. Rob, what I'm going to ask you is a little different. Really? Uh Uh-oh. What's happening now? I I don't handle change well, Dave. You know this. I recognize that, but we're all about (laughs) to go on our holidays. No, no, no. We, we, I, th- I see you've already got your shorts and flip flops on. <laughs> yeah, t- t- trying them out. I've been yeah. down shopping. Really loud, garish shirts. This That's is right. the time. Well, at the moment, you're sitting there shirtless. So I, I, I think a, <laughs> I think a loud, garish shirt would look better, wouldn't it, Marcel? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Robert, what are you excited about doing over the summer? So, so the boys are growing up, so it's maybe only got one or two big holidays left where we're all a single family before oh, university nice. kicks in and stuff. So we're taking the boys out east to Thailand. Oh, um, we're going to do a tour around and a bit of a safari and um, get a bit of beach in there as well. So they've, they've not been out east before, so see a different culture and experience a different lifestyle. So I thought that would be a good one to do. So we got that planned. Thailand that should be fun. is a wonderful place now. Where do you stand on Thai whiskey buckets, Rob? Have you have you have you come across such I things? I don't. What is you educate me? What? So these are like when you when you're in beach bars, right? It might be any bar, in, but the, I saw them in beach bars in the in the islands bit, and they're like you know like little buckets and spades, right? Yes, they're like a cocktail that f- entirely fills one of those buckets, and it's <gasps> predominantly made with Mekong whiskey. What's me? Is it sweet or what's the what's the style of it? It's more like a it's like a blended thing. Uh, I would suggest, whiskey. and then it's got like the ones we were having were were Mekong whiskey, this like local Red Bull which looks like it comes in a medicine bottle, yeah. and then and then Coke basically. So it's like a giant whiskey and Coke with Red Bull in it. Yeah, that's uh, wow. That's an, that'll <laughs> that's be an a, evening. You, you know what though? Just for the purposes of scientific experiment, I think I should try that. I think you should. I think you should, yeah, and I think you should report good. back. <laughs> In in season four, what do you think? <laughs> the car crash that was that yeah. became. You'll after, probably roll yeah, back yeah. into season four somewhere around mid October when we've already done like eight <laughs> yeah, or nine fi- records. Finally made it home after. Uh, <laughs> no, Robert, finding forgot about you. Up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. No, I'm still here. Still here, hey, me. Yeah, yeah. So that should be fun. Looking for, and I suppose, Dave. Then the same question to you. Obviously, been a long old season. What are you going to be getting up to in the uh, in the old summer months? Well, I've got to say it's similar, a similar thing in terms of it's holiday related. Yeah, I've had quite a long run. I completely miscalculated my holiday allowances last year, which means the last holiday I had was the um, end of July last year. It's not like you to get admin wrong, Dave. <laughs> It's normally my strong point, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're renowned for getting all the paperwork bang on first time. <laughs> exactly. That's what I'm, that's what I'm known for. <laughs> but uh, yeah, now, anyway, so it's been a long old time and we are planning a big family holiday to Japan. Oh, cool. Always wanted to go to Japan. It's a country that is definitely on my list of places to see. So it's same, it. same. It has been on my list for a good few years now. And is it, I always watch Star Man in Japan with James May, oh, yeah. but are you doing, what, is there a big island tour going on south, north, any particular highlights you're looking forward to? Yeah, we're doing like, a, to be honest, it's the, it's the trip that most people tend to do where you do a couple of days in a few cities. So we're doing like Osaka. Kyoto and Tokyo. Yeah, cool. With a night in an onsen somewhere near Fuji, I think, if I'm, rem- if I'm remembering that rightly. And then obviously a stopover also in, in Hiroshima. So yeah, I, I absolutely can't wait. That will be one to remember as well. So uh, yeah, enjoy. I've got to say, intimidating to plan. Like there is so much new to try and get your head around. Yeah, and they don't speak English particularly. Well, they do obviously speak English, but it's not, you know, they're not like what we're used to. So when you go over, um, you sometimes need to think on your feet fast. Well, a lot of what you get accustomed to with, with international travel these days where, you know, broadly you can just, as as you know, with some of our work trips, you can bro- you can bro- I can broadly rock up with just my mobile phone and an overnight bag and you can broadly get around. It is not the same like, you know, Phone, phones do work, but they're on very high tariffs. Yeah, yeah. Not necessarily all credit cards work, and actually it's still quite a big cash-based culture. So weirdly, I've kind of almost, I almost don't use cash anymore. I just use my phone for everything. That's not going to work. So there's, there's a few little things that actually genuinely feel like different to the way that you're, I've been orientating myself for a good while. So that's challenging. 
like a lot of places out east, a very welcoming culture. Oh yeah, and, you know, sort of, you That's know, amazing. you know, you're you're going to be in a nice environment, and it'll be very, um, you know, well uh, maintained and happy. So there you go. Oh, I can't wait! I can't wait. So, Shalk, for the final time, why don't you yes. take it away? A huge thanks to our listeners and our guests this season. We really appreciate the time you spent with us. Thanks also to our sound and editing wizards, Ben and Louis, our beeping producer, Marcel, and of course, to all of our listeners. They are on LinkedIn, NX, Dave Chapman, Rob Kernhan. Feel free to follow or connect and please get in touch if you have any comments or ideas for the show. And of course, if you haven't already done that, rate and subscribe to this podcast. See you in another reality soon.